Welcome to Hopewell Heights, a fifth generation farm and homestead. My name is Stephanie. I'm a wife and mother of five, and I share all kinds of things from recipes to, you know, homemaking, homesteading, just chats about different topics, and even dipping into conspiracies, preparedness, all sorts of things. And today we're going to talk about that last thing. We're going to talk a little bit about preparedness because it is election season, which means that things are crazy. People are crazy and things are probably going to get crazier over the next couple of weeks. And in between like November when we vote and January when the next president is inaugurated. Like who knows what's going to happen? Who knows? I've been doing this homesteading thing for like seven years now. I've been around long enough to know that doomsday prepper type people, they're always trying to name the day and the hour when things are just going to go absolutely nuts, right? It's always the next big event, the next election or uh, you know, in three months or they heard something from somebody high up in the government and society is going to completely collapse at this certain date, so you better be prepared or else. And I get it because that makes for really good like YouTube content. If I were to create videos like that all the time, like think of the clickbait titles. I mean, I would probably have a lot more views and I could like make money doing that. But that's just not where I stand. That's not how I live my life, hyper focused in on like societal collapse. However, I am aware that preparedness is important regardless of what is going on in politics, you know, in the United States or anywhere in the world, because at any moment, a natural disaster could happen, a death in the family, something could happen that could affect me and my family. So preparedness is important to me no matter what is going on. And, you know, because this is something that I have made a priority, I actually feel very much at peace now heading into this election. I'm not scared. I'm not anxious. Honestly, it's kind of entertaining. Um, not to say that I'm like taking it lightly or anything, but it's almost like, are we watching a movie? Like, are we being punked here with just how absolutely crazy this is? But I can truly say like, I sleep like a baby at night. So today I'm gonna share with you 10 things that we have here in our home and on our homestead that make me feel confident and prepared for anything. Number one is short and long-term food supply. So keeping a stocked fridge and freezer and pantry for your short-term food supply is so important. I mean, who remembers the toilet paper craze that was totally you know, manufactured by big media and everyone who controls that, where they just came out and said, there's a toilet paper shortage and that created a toilet paper shortage. Well, that could happen at any time with anything like with eggs or with milk or whatever they decide they want to say there's a shortage of, or there could be a legitimate, legitimate shortage of something or just some reason. I mean, flooding anything, for some reason why you couldn't get to the grocery store and get what you need. So having a short, keeping your house stocked for short term for like a week's worth of groceries or a month's worth of groceries is so important. And you all know that I shop at Azure Standard. This is one way that I always have my house stocked up short term. I do a massive grocery haul every month from Azure Standard. And then I use like Thrive Market in between if I need small orders, I've forgotten stuff or they're just, just stuff that I couldn't get at Azure Standard. But this works out really well for us. We've got five kids, we've got the farm, we're very busy and we're not totally self-sufficient. So we don't grow every single thing and raise every single thing on this farm that we need. I'd be really neat to get to that point, but I honestly don't think that we ever will. So for now, having a good source for buying in bulk for our large family, keeping us in the food and groceries and supplies short and long term is great. There are tons of little things that we can do every day to reduce our exposure to toxins, but switching out your mattress for a natural mattress is one really big thing that you can do to make a huge difference in reducing your toxic exposure because the average person sleeps eight hours a day. So that's a third of your life spent sleeping and potentially breathing in harsh chemicals from off-gassing. Most mattress companies use fiberglass as a flame retardant, and that is so dangerous to be breathing that in all night. I have had my Birch Lux natural mattress for about six months now, and I love the peace of mind that comes from sleeping on a natural 
mattress that's actually comfortable. Birch mattresses are GOTS and Green Guard Gold certified, meaning that they are free of any polyurethane based foams and harsh unnecessary chemicals and pollutants. Birch mattresses never contain fiberglass, which it's cheap to use and it's effective as a flame retardant, but like I said, it's really dangerous. Instead, birch mattresses use 100% organic cotton, and for flame resistance, birch uses 100% organic wool, which also really helps with temperature regulation. For all of my moms out there who cloth diaper, you know exactly what I'm talking about. We love wool covers for our cloth diapers because they're great for temperature regulation. You're never too hot, never too cold. It's always just right and they're also flame resistance and they don't hold moisture so they stay nice and clean. One of the best parts about Birch Living is that they will deliver your new mattress straight to your door and even haul the old one away and set your new one up for you if you want them to. But I didn't need that. It, it was actually really easy. They come um, wrapped really small and all you have to do is just like open the wrapping to the mattress and they pop right out and you just put them in place so it's really really simple. They also come with two free eco rest pillows so every mattress that you buy you'll get two natural pillows as well and a 25 year warranty and 100 night sleep trial. So if you try your birch mattresses and for some reason you don't like them then you will get your money back. However, 93% of people say that they would recommend a birch mattress to their friends and 79% say that they have an improvement in just overall comfort and reduced back pain with a birch mattress. Birch Living is currently running their fall into bed sale so it's the perfect time to upgrade your sleep and get 20% off a birch living natural mattress as well as two free eco rest pillows. Just visit my link birchliving.com forward slash Hopewell Heights and check out all the details, read reviews. This is a limited time offer, so you don't want to wait. I will put my link and more details in the description below the video. Now, as far as a long-term food supply, you know, this is something that can really seem intimidating, but if you think about it like this, like in the event of an emergency, like a national level emergency where you're unable to get food or supplies, you're not going to be worried about making like really extravagant meals and having this huge variety of desserts and snacks and all the things. You're really just going to want to make sure that you have the basics for your family. So what I did is I set a goal to get a one year food supply, like a food supply that could last us for one year in the event of an emergency. And so I just focused on things like grains, oats, flour, um, like I have some sugar, we've got deep freezers full of meat. And I know what you're thinking, like if the power went out, what would you do with all that meat? And we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, but we've got chickens, we've got cows. I'll talk a little bit about that later. So this is gonna look a little bit different depending on how much money you have to invest in this or how many people are in your family or what you have access to. So we live on a farm and we do have livestock and some stuff that we raise and produce here on our farm. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, we also have a large family. And at the time that I put this one year food supply together, we did not have a large budget for me to go out and buy a pre-prepared uh, long-term food stash, but that is something you can do. So if you have like disposable income and this is something that you think is important, having a long-term food supply for your family, then you can just buy kits for however many people are in, are in your family for, you know, any length of time. They make, you know, long-term food supplies for like a month, three months, six months. For me, I don't know, a year just seemed like a good goal. It seemed like something that made me feel really confident and just comfortable with what we had. And I put it together myself. Like I said, I did not have the money to invest in kits. So since we live on a farm and we have cattle, we have um, pigs, we have chickens for eggs, I just focused on the other things that we didn't have that would store really well long term. So things like grain, things like flour, you know, oats, wheat, um, I think I did sugar, also things that could be traded. So like coffee, if you ever got in a position to where you were wanting to trade for something that somebody else had or even a service or a skill. So like think about, you know, things got really bad and somebody in your family like needed their appendix taken out and there was a surgeon, you could trade you know, to have that done. I know that I'm kind of like getting into like really worst case scenarios here, but this is what people think about when they build a uh, long-term food supply. You want things that are actually going to store well long-term and things that you could potentially trade. So I will link a tool 
it's a website in the description of the video just tap the more button uh, below the video and you can actually put in how many people are in your family and it will calculate what you need for a particular length of time so if you want to build like a three-month food stash then it will tell you like what you need of each food number two is a plan for if we lost power so I think I mentioned that we have deep freezers full of meat um, and I've said that before and people are like, well, what are you going to do if your power goes out? Well, we do have a generator and that is something that I think is so important. Everyone should have a generator. You know, it's one of those things. Yes, it's an investment. And I think a lot of people think, well, if things get really bad, then I'll just go get a generator. But the thing is, if things would get really bad, you might not be able to get your hands on a generator because everybody else is going to have that same thought or you just might not be able to get to a place that has a generator available. So I think that that's just such a wise investment, something to have on hand. You know, I don't even know where ours is because my husband handles like all of this stuff. Basically everything besides the food <laughs> and I milk the cows and I kind of take care of the chickens. Everything else he handles. I don't know where it is. I know we've got it and I know if something happened, he knows how to hook it up and just how to take care of things. Um, and then that would give us a certain length of time to where I could take the meat from our freezers and process that and, and preserve it in different ways. And we could just get ourselves set up to move into potentially a future where we didn't have access to power. Like I said, who knows if this is ever going to happen in my lifetime. I certainly don't know, but we're prepared in case it does. You know, other things in case we would lose power is just like a light source. I mean, you could get by without it, I guess, but plenty of lighters, flashlights. I also um, have lots of candles. So these are just beeswax candles. I get like a box of different kinds of beeswax candles on every other Azure standard order, and I just put them in my basement. So I have a ton of candles if I would ever need them. Um, and, you know, maybe if I don't need them one day, maybe when my kids get married or something, we'll just use them as like wedding decorations or something. Who knows? I certainly don't know but I have them. Another thing is a water filtration plan. So you can see it behind me. I have a Berkey. I've had it for years and years, and I, I think they're still selling Berkeys, but they went through some kind of legislation. I, I honestly don't even know what came of that. I know that I'm confident in using my Berkey. I have <laughs> taken creek water that you could see was like yellow and nasty and filtered it through that thing, and it was like perfectly clear, tasted delicious. So I would be confident in using my Berkey if we needed it. Um, and yeah, all you do is just take water from anywhere and dump it in the Berkey. It filters it and gives you clean water. So I actually have extra filters that go in there as well. That's something that I always keep on hand. And we do have access to running water. So we do have a creek on our property if we would need a water source. All right, the third thing that I wanna talk about is food preservation tools supplies and skills. So there are a lot of ways to preserve food both short and long term. One way is canning. You guys probably all know what canning is, how to do it. I have tutorials on canning. I'll link them in the description below the video if you want to know more, but I've got huge canners up here. I don't know if you can see them, but they're up in this cabinet. I've got canners that I can use to can food and I know how to do that. So I've got those skills. I've also got what I need for fermentation. I've got what I need for long-term storage of dry foods, like freeze-dried foods or grains. Um, you know, those can just be stored in Mylar bags. And if you don't know what Mylar bags are, I have a whole ebook and it's free that tells you how to store food long-term in Mylar bags. So I'll link that below as well. I also have a freeze dryer. That was very expensive. That's a huge investment. It's definitely not practical for everyone. It's just something that I've wanted for a really long time. And that is a great way to preserve food. That is really good for somebody who has a garden or maybe you have like a ton of chickens like I do, or you have cows, or you have a lot of stuff coming in all the time and you need a way to preserve it the freeze dryer is just great for that so you know if you're watching this and you have absolutely no idea what i'm talking about as, as far as food preservation you don't have any of these supplies or skills don't worry about that I, I definitely wouldn't worry about that what i would do is just buy books this is a tip that i have like if there's a skill that i want to learn but i just don't have time to learn at the moment i buy a book on that skill and then i just like put it in my office it's there if I ever need to learn how to do it. And as far as supplies, you know, um, I would probably recommend just getting like Mylar bags. These are great, they're easy to store. And if you're not ready to build a food stash just yet, uh, yeah, you can just tuck them away in a cabinet or something. And then even if you started as simple as like every time you went to the store and you bought flour or you bought oats, buy double and then store the extra in Mylar bags, put them in five gallon buckets, 
tuck them away somewhere in your basement. And that's just one small way to start building a food stash. But you know, other skills like fermenting and curing are really, really important if there would ever be a situa situation where the grid would go down and we still have food coming in from the garden. We're still able to grow food and you know raise livestock. Well, when we harvest that, we need a way to preserve it. So having those skills is so important if you live on a homestead. Fourth thing on my list is some kind of heat source and some way to cook your food. And for us, we have lots of firewood. We have access to lots of firewood here on our farm. And we have a wood stove. There it is, a little, I think you say yodel, it's J-O-T-U-L. Little wood stove that also has a cooktop on it so I can actually cook on that since I have a lot of cast iron. And that little wood stove will heat almost our entire house. Like it's really powerful. And our house is about 2,200 square feet. So just some kind of plan for heat and some way to cook your food is essential. We also have a grill, we've got a blackstone, we've got lots of propane. That's another thing is just like keeping propane tanks on hand, I mean, that could really go a long way if you just use something like a Blackstone to prepare your food, or you could even, um, you know, have propane tanks and have setups to where you could use canners to can and preserve food. So that's really important, like I said, especially if you still have a garden and you're producing and you're needing to preserve food in an off-grid situation. The fifth thing is something that I'm not gonna show you because you know people get upset about this kind of stuff, YouTube gets upset about this kind of stuff, but it's a reality um, that needs to happen. We do have a safe and it's full of things. I'm just gonna say things. Maybe it's full of like, um, I don't know, like water balloons or something like that. No, it's full of stuff that a person might need if they needed to go out and like hunt food or defend their property, or defend themselves, or if they needed to trade things, or if they needed important documents. There's all kinds of things that we should be keeping in a safe, and we do have that, so that is something that I would just highly, highly recommend. Number six is chickens. This is like a no-brainer if you even have a little bit of property. Chickens are like the gateway drug to homesteading because they're so easy, they're so cheap. You know, it's like a couple bucks to get a baby chick at the feed store. Um, you know, you can let them free range. They can be mostly self-sufficient and they give you an egg a day. If you get like really good egg laying breeds, um, they lay very heavily. A lot of times they'll lay, eggs year round. It just kind of depends on where you live. But even if they don't lay in the winter, if you have a heat or light source, like a heat lamp, then you can kind of extend their laying season and they can be really productive. And then if you have something like a freeze dryer um, or you know how to water glass eggs, then you can preserve eggs to hopefully last you all year. Now, I like to keep like dual purpose birds that also make, um, great meat birds. So we keep around 40 to 50 chickens at all times and we have, you know, several roosters. So the eggs are always fertile. They're always hatching eggs every spring and summer. We have new baby chicks and it's just kind of a good cycle that, you know, keeps itself itself going and they're all good dual purpose birds. So like good heritage birds like Rhode Island Reds. Um, gosh, I'm forgetting like the names of the other breeds, but I'll list them. I, I think I have a blog post actually on good dual purpose chicken breeds. So I'll link that in the description, but um, yeah, they can keep you in eggs and be a good source for meat and broth as well. Number seven is dogs. To me, having dogs is so important no matter what, like not just in a preparedness aspect, but if you have any amount of property, or I guess even if you don't, even if you live in town, actually this might be more important if you live in town. Having a dog around, just having big dogs around just makes me feel very secure. And especially if you have any kind of livestock. It's really, really important. No matter if you're expecting like some kind of natural disaster or any kind of crazy political event, just to protect your livestock, have a livestock protection plan. I know for the first few years that we had chickens, we had constant massacres where we would just like have our entire flock wiped out. And it was just so discouraging, disappoint disappointing. We were wasting a lot of time and money. I felt like we were hardly getting any eggs because they would just get to that age of maturity where we they would start laying eggs and they would all get wiped out by like a fox or a raccoon or something. So since we've had livestock guardian dogs, we hardly ever lose chickens. But you know, in the event of something happen, happening, having good dogs around to, you know, just defend our home and kind of watch over our kids and our livestock really does make me feel a lot more secure. Number eight on my list is dairy cattle. Now there's a reason that I'm saying dairy cattle and not beef cattle. 
because dairy cattle, you know, how it works is they produce a lot more milk than like beefier breeds. So they produce enough milk for their calf and then they still have like an abundance of milk after that, a ton of milk, even when they have their calf on them all day long. So, you know, a dairy cow could be nursing its calf all day and still give you an extra like three to four or maybe even more gallons a day. So if you were in a situation where food was short, like your entire family could survive on like eggs from your chickens and dairy from your dairy cow. And the great thing about dairy cows is if necessary, they can be butchered for beef or, you know, if they have a bull calf like a boy calf, right? And you could feed that out for beef. Whereas with beefier breeds like Angus, like, you know, it's great for beef, but they're just not gonna give you that excess milk. So with a dairy cow, you're kind of getting two for one. Now, just like chickens, there are dual purpose um, cattle breeds as well that make, it, they're great for producing extra milk. So great as a dairy breed. And they also grow out like a lot stockier, a lot beefier. So they're good for dairy and for beef. And my personal, favorite dual purpose breed is the Normandy. They're pretty rare, they're hard to find, but my mom and dad actually have a herd of Normandies. My Jersey cows that you see right here <coughs> behind me, they are bred to my mom and dad's Normandy bull. So I'll be having little like Normandy Jersey cross babies within the next couple of months. And our goal is to transition over to a Normandy herd. I don't know if we'll like ever totally get rid of having jerseys because I really love our jerseys. They've been so great. Like they're so gentle and sweet. They're great milkers. In the spring and summer, I'll have a, you know, the half of the milk that I get is cream. The cream line is just insane. So I really do love having jerseys. We'll see how it go. It goes having Normandies. But I mean, honestly, I really could not imagine not having access to cattle for beef or for dairy in some kind of situation where we really needed to have food. And you know, the great thing about cattle, chickens, and if you have pigs, then you can use the manure on your garden to fertilize that. You know, everything just works really nicely together. And if you have pigs, then they'll eat like anything. They'll eat scraps, they'll eat whatever. You can put them out to pasture. They might root up your pasture a little bit, but um, hey, oh, there's our little baby. She wants to come and be on the video. This is our bottle baby. Oh, she's like way down there by my feet. She's gonna. <laughs> okay, we'll just get down here so little Charlotte can be in the video. Um, but as I was saying, pigs are great too. We do uh, raise pigs, but we just get like feeder pigs. We don't breed them here on our farm. Every spring we get some feeder pigs for the kids. They feed them out and we butcher them and then we have pork and that goes in the freezer. Oh, and I know one more thing that I was gonna say about dairy cattle is, you know, three, four, five plus gallons of milk every single day seems like a lot, but you can actually put that to use on the rest of your farm. So you can give that milk, you can clabber that milk, which essentially you just like set it out at room temperature and it kind of starts to curdle. Um, and you can feed it to your pigs. You can feed it to your chickens or you can like soak their grain in it and make that stretch a lot longer. So it really would keep like the whole farm going if we got in a situation to where things were just stretched really thin. So yeah, if I haven't made it clear enough already, like having a dairy cow is so, so beneficial in my opinion. Number nine is old, old tractors, equipment, and tools. Stuff that is not electronic because a lot of the new stuff, actually most of the new tractors and, and farm equipment and tools that you buy, ha, you know, they have microchips and they have software management rights programs. So you cannot fix these things yourself. You actually have to take them somewhere to be fixed, which would definitely be a problem in an emergency situation. So if this all sounds crazy, I promise you this is actually not crazy. Um, like prepper people talk about this a lot, buying old tractors, buying old things that can be fixed easily with limited resources um, and you know just with manpower because back in the old days, that's all people had. So when they bought a tractor, they just didn't have the ability to like, you know, haul it somewhere and get fixed and have all these like computerized parts. They had what they had there on their farm and they had to be able to repair tools and have them, you know, in working condition during all the seasons. And number 10, last but definitely not least, actually this should be like number one, and it's just having a handy husband. Or if you're not married, like your dad, you, I'm sorry, ladies, like you need 
a man in your life if something crazy were to happen because otherwise it's just not gonna go well for you. You know, like I like to make jokes about all this kind of stuff and part of why I can be lighthearted about it is because I know that in the event of something crazy happening, ooh, there's just a bug in my hair, um, my husband would take care of us. So like he likes to make fun of me all the time about all the little things that I do to get prepared because he's like, why do you, why do you even worry? Like I've got this, I've got it under control. If anything were to happen, we're going to be fine. Like I will figure it all out. I've already got it all taken care of. So that is, I think like the number one thing that you could do to be prepared is just know like who's going to take care of you, especially if you're mom, because you got to take care of all the babies. Like that's me. I mean, whether anything crazy happens or not, like I've got to focus on taking care of the kids. So knowing that he is going to take care of me so that I can take care of the kids, he's going to take care of us is probably the number one prepping hack. Check the description of this video if you're wanting links to anything that I mentioned or talked about. I will try to remember to link everything, but that is all I have for you this week. Thanks for tuning in and I will see you next week.